I'm, uh, is this working? Is it working? I can't see you out there. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry I got lost. I was just sitting over there paying, uh, paying attention to what was, uh, <laughs> what was, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but, but my, my clock is ticking here and it may explode or something uh, when I'm done. I, I, I appreciate you coming this morning uh, to hear what I have to say. And I also appreciate being the, uh, old fat science guy with a bad back uh, and, and uh, no athletic ability at all. Uh, but my, I have a degree from Florida State too, so for those of you who are... Uh, okay. uh, I'm going to tell you a, a science story today and try not to put you to sleep with it, but um, uh, science, uh, in keeping with the uh, theme of this uh, meeting, science is communicated by uh, storytelling, either um, uh, in writing, uh, which is a challenge for many of us, or, or in uh, sort of venues like this, which is a challenge for some of us as well. Uh, when I talk to science aficionados about what I do, it's pretty, uh, um, pretty easy. To, they may not always agree with me. Uh, actually, I shouldn't do this because I'm on a time clock here, but that first woman reminded me uh, that I'm wrong all the damn time. I, I, I have file drawers full of proposals with my hypotheses in them that were completely wrong. That's how I live, right? I mean, I I make a mistake and then I go, and then I go try and uh, and figure it out. Uh, but anyway, so uh, talking to science aficionados is pretty easy. Talking to a group as um, sort of eclectic as this uh, is often a challenge to keep everyone uh, on point. Um, in part because. Um, Everything's sort of complicated, which I'll, I'll try to uh, um, uh, fix. And most of you don't have a tremendous background in molecular genetics. Is that, <laughs> is, is that right? That's sort of what I was afraid of. Uh, so uh, when, I, when I talk about first principles, that, uh, which is what a lot of scientists try to discover, that's, that's an issue um, uh, as well. So it's become, uh, uh, it's become, um, fashionable lately uh, for scientists to worry about how to communicate what we do to the public. I just picked this off out of Science Magazine, which came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, written by Al Leshner, who is the CEO of the organization that, um, that uh, publishes science, and you can read it. There's no shortage of topic where policymakers or other members of the public seem to persistently misunderstand, misrepresent, or disregard the underlying science. You can think of huge numbers of examples of that, I'm sure. Consequently, there's a call for scientists to do a better job of communicating both the meaning uh, and the nature of their work. And I sort of uh, um, agree with that, and I agree with the notion that I need to work hard to make you uh, understand all that stuff, but it's a two-way street. You gotta work hard, too. I mean, I'm not just going to sit here and tell you, you know, stuff that's necessarily trivial or easy or amusing or whatever. I mean, it's in part the public's job to keep up to pace um, with the science as well. Whether or not you believe it's another issue, but, but uh, it, it's a two-way street. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to um, tell you a story today. It's about an uh, animal that's turning into a uh, uh, plant. Uh, as was alluded to earlier. So it's an example of evolution happening right before our eyeballs. I mean, it's an animal that's, that's taken on plant-like characteristics. Um, to do that, it has to use genes from plants. So it's an example of gene therapy. Gene therapy doesn't work very well now, at least in humans, but this animal's figured out how to do it. So if we can understand how the animal does it, maybe we can help. That's sort of the uh, part of the rationale for doing it. I think it's an interesting possibility about how we might um, at least supplement nutrition. Instead of having a hamburger, you go out and sit in the sun for a while, you know, good to go. I, I actually tried to sell that to the Navy for their frogmen, but that's a whole other story that I won't, I won't uh, bore you with. Uh, and it also will provide you the truth uh, behind Swamp Thing which was one of the stupidest science fiction movies that was, <laughs> that, that was ever made, but sort of amusing to me. Anyway, 
Uh, my story starts about 30, uh, 30 years ago, not with Swamp Thing at all, but uh, up in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I was teaching in the summer at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Actually, I saw the model of the uh, Alvin submarine out there. Uh, I've been in that, but only with a hatch open. If they closed the hatch, they'd have to drug me. But um, this is a group, uh, I don't know, in the 19, late, late 1970s, maybe early 1980s, of uh, some very bright, highly motivated uh, college students who came from around the country uh, to learn about marine biology. And a couple of the women in the course, actually it's the two dead center in the middle there, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, but it's the two dead center in the, in the middle row there, uh, fr front row, um, walked into my office uh, with a Petri dish containing this. <laughs> this thing is an inch long and you know, sort of the slug that ate Tampa here from the size on this screen. But, but uh, you'll notice that it's, um, that it's green. I'd never seen it before. And uh, the students uh, uh, were quite interested in uh, doing a project on it. So I said, well, let's figure out what it was. We did, you can see its name up there, partially cut off. It's uh, Alicia Clorotica. Um, and what caught my fancy about it was it lives in a weird place for uh, soft-bodied marine animals, namely salt marshes. Uh, this is a salt marsh where we collected up on Martha's Vineyard. The uh, woman is Julie Schwartz, who's working across the street, about done with her PhD, and uh, the guy with the mustache is Phil Alitalo, who works at Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, up there and helps us out. And uh, we're about to go collecting, and where we collect them is here. That's obviously uh, when I still had my boyish good looks, but, but that's, uh, uh, that's on a cold November day. Um, uh, up on Martha's Vineyard. The slugs live in the bottom of those tide creeks and we go out at low tide and collect them with our high-tech collecting gear, which is a sawed off turkey baster and a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a Ziploc bag, uh, which is sort of embarrassing, but you know, I'm a biochemist, what can I say? I, and um, uh, uh, I, so I, they live in, in weird places for soft-bodied animals and I began to work on them uh, to study some of the uh, biochemical adaptations to do that with and I would go and give talks about it to, to, to uh, uh, various groups and afterwards people come up and say, well, what you're doing is very interesting, but those damn things are green, why aren't you working on that? And I resisted for years, but finally I, I, uh, I began to turn my attention to that. And actually it had been known since the uh, early 1970s that, to make a long story short, that those animals are green because they have chloroplasts in them. Those of you who remember back to grammar school biology know that chloroplasts is a characteristic of a plant, right? Animals don't have chloroplasts. Animals can't photosynthesize. Animals don't have chlorophyll. But these guys, these guys have, uh, have uh, chloroplasts that they get from the algae that they eat. Now the algae that this slug eats is shown up there in the left side, it's a very nondescript, sort of bad smelling green bunch of filaments uh, that sit in the salt marsh and that's a light micrograph of what, they, of what the filaments actually uh, look like. They're a hollow tube and each one of those green, uh, uh, green spots in the uh, tube is a chloroplast. And, and what the animal does is it slits open the chloroplast, uh, sucks out the contents like a soda straw, and certain cells that line the walls of the digestive tract are able to take up the chloroplasts and keep them. And they not only keep them, they keep them for long periods of time, and if you shine light on the animal, it photosynthesizes. It fixes carbon and it blows off oxygen. Uh, now, just to give you a little chemistry, it's real, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, I have to give you the pictures first. This is what the chloroplasts look like. Uh, this is the chloroplast inside the algal filament, and it's a weird looking chloroplast. Usually they're circular or, or maybe football shaped. These guys have that long uh, teardrop tail, which I'll come back to, um, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, this is the slug digestive system itself. It's a slug sandwich between two glass slides. And the tubes that you can see there are the digestive tubules which spread throughout the entire body of the, of the cell. And, and the, the, the green horseshoes are the cul-de-sacs where the cells are that contain the, the chloroplasts, and you can see they're green, right? Chloroplasts have chlorophyll in them, so, so, uh, 
so they're green. And the chloroplast inside the slug cell looks like this. Uh, you can see they're rounded up. This is the nucleus of the slug is labeled NU there, and the, the, the whole slug cell that we're looking at is, is the size of the stage. Okay, so we have very high magnification here. But notice how the tail, see the T with the arrow in it, is wrapped around the body of the chloroplast. That's because there's a membrane. So the, the, the thing is inside a membrane inside the, uh, inside the, uh, the slug cell, and it works. So here's the equation that I was talking about. Whoops, my arrow sort of, <clears throat> that's the difficulty of switching max to PowerPoints. Anyway, uh, that's the fundamental equation that keeps life on this planet going. Without that reaction, we would not be here. The whole surface of this planet would look like Mars. Carbon dioxide plus water, in the presence of sunlight and a bunch of enzymes and a chloroplast, will make energy-containing compounds, usually carbohydrates like sugar, sometimes they're lipids, and I won't bore you with the details of that, and oxygen, which gets blown off from the uh, uh, from the algal cell. That's a plant reaction. Animals can't do that. Why can't they do it? We don't have the enzymes and we don't have the, we don't have the uh, chlorophyll and we don't have the chloroplast to do it. But these sea slugs do. They're able to keep the chloroplast running, photosynthesize, and after they get their initial uh, group of, of chloroplasts, they can complete their entire life cycle, a whole year without ever eating again. You should be saying, holy shit, really? <laughs> but I said it for you because it's not nice for you, the audience to be yelling that to me. <laughs> okay, so they have these chloroplasts and, and you would say photosynthesis, all right. So they got a couple of chloroplasts inside them. Uh, they can photosynthesize a little bit, but it shouldn't last for very long. Why not? because proteins and chlorophyll inside the chloroplast are damaged by the sunlight. So photosynthesis goes along and all that stuff occurs, but, but it's damaged and it has to be replaced. And it is replaced in the algal cell by, by genes that code for the proteins that make them, and those genes are in the algal cell nucleus. There ain't no algal cell nucleus in the, inside the slug cell. So, you think, well, okay, so maybe it can do it because it's got some leftover chemicals in it, whatever, but it can't do it for very long. But it does, for months. And that was the interest everyone was trying to get me to work on. So I finally said, okay, we will. And for the past 15 years, really, we've been trying to figure out how the animals can do that. I mean, just think of the possibilities. Gene therapy, photosynthesis in animals, gene transfer, all that kind of stuff, very important, potentially. Uh, with this sort of thing. And we've been working on uh, the slug that I showed you. We've all been also been working on, on this sea slug. Uh, any of you who do any diving uh, in the Keys or, or, or um, Caribbean may have run into it. It's called the lettuce sea slug. Again, it's a couple inches long in, in spite of the fact it's enormous on this, uh, um, on this screen here. Uh, and these guys live in barrow pits uh, along the U.S. when I'm running way out of time here. I gotta stop telling jokes. Um, uh, along uh, US-1. So the next time you go to Key West, you see a barrel pit, you can amaze your friends by jumping in, you'll find a sea slug. Uh, you'll find a sea slug right there. Um, so uh, what we, the critical part of maintaining these plastids inside the animal cells is that the maintenance has to be there. The proteins have to be regenerated and chlorophyll has to be made. And so that's what we look for and indeed we found it and since I'm almost uh, getting short on uh, time here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip the data, you'll be pleased to know. Well, except for one piece. Um, that's just the experiment. Uh, what this graph shows you is that these, uh, this is a, a piece of x-ray film that's been exposed to a extract of proteins from the chloroplasts inside the slug cell. So we've extracted, uh, we've, we've uh, fed the slugs up on radioactivity. Uh, that radioactivity has been incorporated into the proteins. The proteins have been run out on a gel and here we put it out here. And the point of this is, is that chloroplast proteins are being synthesized inside the animal cell. Come on, that's another holy shit. Woo! Yeah, there you go, right, exactly. I mean, who the thought that? I told my technician she messed up when she did that. I said, go do that again. That can't possibly be. 
proteins are being synthesized. Plant proteins that are, whose genes reside in the algal cell, which is still out in the marsh somewhere, are being synthesized in these sea slugs inside my laboratory. Same deal with chlorophyll. I know you can't read that. that that's, that's sort of the point, but welcome to my world. This is, this is a biochemical pathway that shows you how chlorophyll gets synthesized. There's 15 enzymatic steps. It starts way off here on the left and goes to that little green box in the middle. Right? And each one of those steps, the point is, each one of those steps is catalyzed by an enzyme, which is a protein whose gene is in the algal cell nucleus, not in the animal. You don't have genes to synthesize proteins. So, but chlorophyll has to be turned over if these, if these things are going to continue to photosynthesize. And so we asked those chlorophyll, is chlorophyll synthesized? And here's, see, I got smart and didn't do any data. Here's the paper. The, yes. Chlorophyll is synthesized inside the animal. That's a plant-like characteristic. If you put on, a, on an exam, in my class actually, that chlorophyll was an animal characteristic, you'd get it wrong. Because it's not. It's a plant cell characteristic. But here it is, and it requires genes. So where are those genes? And how did they get there? Um, I don't, yeah, which is the point that I just made. Uh, we've been collaborating for the last three or four years with the uh, Chinese genome sequencers. These are the guys that just did the giant panda genome and the rice genome and so on. Major worldwide sequencing muscle over in, over in Hong Kong, along with the computer a capacity to do it. And what these guys agreed to do was two things. Number one, they said we want to sequence the slug genome and we'll look in there to see if we can find any algal genes. And we have to sequence the algal genome, too, because we don't know what to look for. If all we have is the slug genome data, even if those genes are there, we won't know it because we can't recognize them. We don't know what their sequences are. So we took both these massive sets of DNA, put them into a computer, and said to the computer, throw out everything that doesn't match. Okay? And what does match should be the genes that have been transferred into the, into the slug genome. What do you think we found? Nothing. No. If we, find, if we found nothing, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. <laughs> but other people before us tried and found nothing. And the reason that they didn't find anything was because they didn't have the Chinese sequencing muscle. Here's just some quick data. Ours is the bottom red one. Look at the red numbers. Look at the ones on top. The first one that failed had half a million gene sequences. You may say, well, that's a lot. The Chinese gave me 98 million sequences. Huge amounts. Right? And if you look at that, and if you have the algal sequences to match it to, what we found is over there, that number 52 is important. There are at least 52 algal genes in the slug DNA that have somehow been transferred from the nucleus of the algal cell into the slug cell, and that's gene transfer, right? That's gene therapy. That's exactly what we were, uh, what we were um, uh, hoping to find. So what, you might say, well, it's the first demonstration of a naturally occurring transfer of genes between multicellular organisms. No one's ever shown that before. People have, have, have argued about whether or not it occurs, but, but um, no one's ever been able to show it before. The slugs know how to do it. Exactly what gene therapy is trying to accomplish and doesn't work very well. I mean, if you have the misfortune to have a disease that requires a correct gene to be inserted with you, they can't do it very well yet. It's also a rapid means of evolution. You don't have to wait for a spontaneous uh, mutation and natural selection and all the stuff that everyone worries about in, in high school biology. These genes have already been shaped by evolution. They've already, been, they've already been vetted by evolution. And if you take that gene and you stick it into another animal somehow and it works, you made a new species. Bam. No must, no fuss. <laughs> Finally, I love this title. It brings tears to my eyes. This is my, almost my last slide, even though I'm, well, light's flashing at me. I don't know what's going on here. But um, uh, that came out of an Italian magazine uh, where an uh, Italian uh, magazine um, person wrote a story about it. And it says, the, the slugs that eat the sun. I mean, isn't that nice? It brings tears, almost. But, but, but the point is that 
these animals can exist without eating. They can do their entire life cycle, including reproduction, including growth, for a year without eating. Right now, can we, can we convert that to us? I don't know, I, maybe. And certainly probably not in my lifetime, but, but uh, it's something to think about. So, uh, this is my last slide. This is an animal that Charles Darwin would have loved if he'd have known about it. And, and it's, also, it's also an animal that uh, creates fascination with children as well. Thank you very much for your time.